Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund. Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Bill Bohr, CEO of Great Lakes Brewing Company and a proud City Club member. It's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dan Egan. Dan is a Milwaukee Journal Sentinel reporter and the author of The Death and Life of the Great Lakes. Today marks the City Club's fifth annual State of the Great Lakes Address. This annual forum began in 2013 as an effort by the City Club to remind us how important our Great Lakes truly are. I'm sure most here today would agree that they're probably the most important natural resource in our region. We at Great Lakes Brewing certainly think so. Lake Erie provides outstanding water for our products. As Pat Conway says, beer, uh, if you have a beer, it's 99% water, 100% if it's a domestic light beer. <laughs> <laughs> Over the years, we've heard a lot of the statistics, facts, and history about the Great Lakes. The facts that the lakes contain one-fifth of the world's fresh water, and that the passage of the Clean Water Act was largely attributable to the advocacy efforts made after the Cuyahoga River last burned in 1969. At Great Lakes Brewing, we commemorate this with the name of one of our more popular beers, as well as the Burning River Fest held each summer to raise awareness and money for water-related causes. Our great lake, Lake Erie, has had its challenges. At one point, things were so bad that the lake was declared dead. The original version of Dr. Seuss's children's book, The Lorax, included the line, I hear things are just as bad up in Lake Erie. The lake was not, in fact, dead, but rather it was full of toxic algae that killed off native aquatic species. The Ohio Sea Grant Program wrote to Dr. Seuss to tell him about the efforts to clean up the lake and Dr. Seuss in turn removed the line. <laughs> in his newest book, our speaker traces the history of the Great Lakes. From their glacier formation through the engineering marvels that allowed for shipping what is currently upwards of 125 million tons of cargo annually through the St. Lawrence Seaway. He describes how this evolution has led to the introduction of invasive species that now threaten water intake pipes, hydroelectric dams, and other infrastructure across the North Coast. We're very pleased to have Mr. Egan here to share these stories and about the death and life of Great Lakes. A native of Green Bay, Wisconsin, Mr. Egan grew up to love Lake Michigan by spending summer weekends and vacations on the Door Peninsula, where both his sets of grandparents had summer homes. After graduating from the University of Michigan with a degree in history in 1989, he moved out west and worked as assistant park historian at Yellowstone National Park. In 1992, he began his newspaper career at the Idaho Mountain Express in Sun Valley before moving on to papers in Idaho Falls and Salt Lake City. During this time, Mr. Egan covered a range of environmental issues, including efforts to restore threatened and endangered species like wolves, salmon, and grizzly bears. He moved back to Wisconsin in 2002. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please welcome Dan Egan. Thanks so much for having me here. I'm, I haven't been to, I've been to Cleveland once. This is my second time and, and I love it. It's like a, a big Milwaukee and, and I love Milwaukee so maybe I'd like Cleveland more. Um, writing and talking are two different disciplines. They're very different disciplines and um, the writing this book took me 18 months and I was pretty much alone in a room uh, just working material that I had um, first reported for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel 
um, beginning in 2003. So it was a long, lonely process, and I would come home sometimes at the end of the day, and I hadn't talked to anybody because I didn't need to do a lot of interviews. I had done them previously. So I would open the door and walk in. I have a wife and four young kids, and my voice would crackle like I had just woken up. And uh, so, so I had this long period of isolation, and then I finished writing the book, and then I look up, and I see rooms like this, and it just... It puts a pit in my stomach. The only thing worse would be to look up and see nobody. <laughs> but, <laughs> but this is next to it for me because I don't like to speak. Um, and and I, was, I was given 25 to 28 minutes to give this talk, and it was about a, the state of the Great Lakes. So because I'm a writer, not a talker, I typed up a speech that took me 26 minutes and 30 seconds to give. And then, and then in these introductions, some of this thunder that I thought I had in these pages was stolen, and it dawned on me that you guys don't really need to know how many times the Cuyahoga burned and when and what happened after. And so I'm looking at this speech like, Ugh, it's reminding me... <laughs> <laughs> It's reminding me of, um, I don't know if you heard earlier this week about the guy who climbed El Capitan without, without any ropes. <laughs> I'm just gonna, just gonna wing it. This is, <laughs> if I fall, <laughs> somebody come get me. All right. So yeah, I'm a native of, of Green Bay, Wisconsin, and, and through the heart of my hometown, we have the Fox River. It's not as famous as the Cuyahoga, but it was probably as dirty as the Cuyahoga. I was born in 1967. This river is the most heavily industrialized river in the world in terms of pulp and paper mills. And so I was born in 1967. That would make me a kid in the mid-1970s, 8, 10, 11-year-old kid, and I would play along the banks of the Fox River, and my parents would get upset. And it wasn't because they were afraid that me and my brothers were going to drown. They were, they, they were afraid we were going to get sick. It was like playing at the dump, they thought. And it was. It was a liquid dump. Um, one of my fond memories of this river was scouring the riverbanks for little nuggets of sulfur. And we would bring these, these little yellow globs home, and we would light them, and it would... Uh, emit like this this awful stench and the ooze like lava and we just thought it was like a, a low grade firework given to us by nature you know it's <laughs> nature's bounty how wonderful it, it, later i learned that it was uh, an unfortunate byproduct of of the um, pulp making process and uh, the river was in a real bad way back then but we still loved it we thought it was normal which you know is is probably one of the more uh, tragic things about our, our environmental history is how quickly we get used to things. I'm going to talk real quickly about um, where I, I'm coming from and how I came to write this book. Uh, so yes, I, I, I grew up in Green Bay. I went to college in Michigan. I moved out west, took a job in central Idaho uh, for the Idaho Mountain Express. And one of my first assignments was to go up into the, the mountains of the, the, it was right next to the Frank Church of River of No Return Wilderness. Huge wide open spaces, nothing like Green Bay or Cleveland. I mean, it was a mind-blowing place, but it had its own environmental problems. One of my first stories was to go up into those mountains and cover the, a candlelight vigil that they were having every Saturday night for the return of the Snake River sockeye salmon. This is a distinct species that swims some 900 miles in from the ocean, 7,000 miles up into the mountains, and spawns at a place called Redfish Lake. It was called Redfish Lake because tens of thousands of these fish used to return uh, each late summer. By the time I got there in 1992, they weren't counting them by the thousands or the hundreds. They, they weren't even counting them on their fingers. That year, one fish returned. They called him Lonesome Larry. And they know he returned because there was a fish weir, so they'd swim up the stream toward Redfish Lake, and when they got to the lake, they'd get caught in a trap. And the idea was that they would use them in a captive breeding program to keep the species alive while they figured out how to, how to fix the dams that were really choking their migration route down to the ocean. So Lonesome Larry a lot arrives without a mate, and he ends up getting mounted in this lonesome way, like on a plaque, and... <laughs> that was a dirty joke. Um, <laughs> uh, 
it, I think it was put in the governor's office or maybe the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. But but they saved his sperm and and they used it with with um, fish that had arrived in previous years and and fish that had arrived in subsequent years. And today that that species still persists. It's it, it's done better now. It's doing worse, but it's still alive. And this is relevant because when I moved back to my home state of Wisconsin in 2002, I was still thinking about Lonesome Larry when I took my then toddler down to the um, Milwaukee lakefront. It was mid-September and, and, and the Lake Michigan salmon were coming into spawn. And I, and I had some trepidation, reluctance moving back to Milwaukee after being in the wide open spaces of the West. But I remember that Saturday thinking, at least my daughter's not going to grow up in a place where the salmon are kept alive by cross-generational captive breeding with cryogenically frozen sperm. And, you know, this is, a, this is a great, healthy salmon fishery. I didn't know a lot about it at the time. Um, I started learning that morning. Something curious was going on. I'll never forget this. These fish were trying to swim up the boat ramps. And I asked the fisherman, what, what are they doing? And is, are they trying to spawn on the boat ramp? And he said, oh, no, they can't spawn here. They, they may try to, but the habitat here just isn't, isn't sufficient. It's, it's too polluted. Uh, these fish were basically raised in hatcheries, dropped in the lake, born to be caught. And I knew, I had a vague understanding that salmon weren't native to the Great Lakes, but I, it never really dawned on me that it was a big, in some ways, put-and-take fishery. And I went back to my boss at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, who happened to be a Green Bay guy as well. And so that meant I could knock on his door and walk in because he was the managing editor and usually have to be there a little bit longer. But the Green Bay people stick together. And I, I asked him, you know, has anybody written about, you know, the, the history of the salmon program? And he said, well, everybody knows it. And one of the things about being a reporter is you try to gauge what everybody knows. And... And I spent the next few weeks just talking to people, and it was striking to me that they were just as ignorant as I was. So I went back to my boss, and I said, can I tell this, the story of how salmon came into the Great Lakes? And he said, sure. So I wrote not just a story. I believe it was like a three-part series. And, and I quickly realized that the, the story about the Great Lakes, the most important story today about the Great Lakes, isn't about the salmon. They're, they're a player in it, but really, the salmon are, are, are really a vehicle to get at the big picture. And the big picture, to my mind, is invasive species and what they've done to the lakes in the last 40 years. Okay, thanks to Cleveland. Thank you guys for getting upset enough after that spark dropped off that train on that bridge on June 22nd, 1969, to get, to get the ball rolling on, on cleaning up the lakes in terms of legacy pollutions and in terms of industrial excrements. I'm talking about things that come out of pipes and spew out of smokestacks. And it costs a lot of money. I mean, $4 billion, that's, that's an amazing amount of money, but, but the need was there. And that was just sewage. You're talking about industry, it was uh, untold billions of dollars. But we figured out you can cap a smokestack and you can plug a pipe. And we got a handle on this, on this historical pollution but the Clean Water Act, which drove a lot of this, failed us in one significant way, and that is, for whatever reason, it initially exempted ballast water from ship, of ships sailing up the St. Lawrence Seaway into the Great Lakes. Now, ballast water is used to steady ocean-going freighters, any freighter, out on the open sea. Rarely is a boat perfectly balanced with all its cargo so it can float at an appropriate level. They're not meant to bob high up. They're meant to plow through the water. So to compensate for this unevenly loaded cargo or for an empty boat, they, they, they bring on ballast. Historically, it was things like sand, bricks, iron bars, anything heavy. But as the ships got bigger, it became more and more difficult to load and unload this stuff, and people realized that water at... I don't know what it is, eight pounds a gallon, is, is suitably heavy for ballast. And so we started using ballast water to balance and to steady ships. The problem is this water is not dead weight. It is anything but that. It carries a pollutant in it that is probably the most potent pollutant in the universe. It's DNA. It's living organisms. This is a kind of pollution that you can't fix by capping a smokestack or plugging a pipe. It doesn't decay 
It doesn't disperse to harmless levels. It does quite the opposite. It breeds. We didn't know what a problem this was really until the late 1980s when, when the first real nasty invader arrived in the Great Lakes, and that would be the zebra mussel. Not long after that came the quagga mussel. And what these mussels have done to the lakes is really hard to grasp, especially when you go to a tall building and look out over the lake, or as I was last night flying in, you look down and the lakes are as beautiful as they've ever been. I mean, they almost look like the Caribbean. There's just this crystalline blue, depending on how the, the light's hitting it. But these clear, beautiful lakes, that, that clearness is not the sign of of a clean lake necessarily. It's not the sign of a healthy lake. It's a sign of a lake that's getting the life sucked out of it. In my hometown in Milwaukee, if I were to go to Bradford Beach, which is maybe two miles from my house, and, and go out beyond the sandy area where the waves keep the mussels from, from actually taking root, I could walk from Milwaukee to Muskegon on a bed of mostly quagga mussels, which are very closely related to zebra mussels. They both came in the same way from the same place, the Caspian Sea Basin, up, up the St. Lawrence Seaway and discharged in, in ship ballast water. I could walk on a bed of these quagga mussels from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to Muskegon, Michigan, a distance of some 90 miles, the whole way. These mussels are clustering at densities up to 100,000 per square meter. And you know they're fingernail size, so you do the math in your head and you think, how can you fit 100,000 mussels on a square meter? Well, it's not a one-dimensional situation. They, they stack on top of each other and become like this gnarly coral. And what it really is is a filtering system. And they're filtering out the plankton in the lakes that are the bo bottom of the, the food chain. And everything else above that suffers. Studies are showing now that Lake Michigan, which looks a lot like Lake Superior did naturally, um, has during the, the critical time of the year, just like your grass grows fast in May, that's when algae is supposed to grow fast out in the lakes. Uh, our, our, our populations of healthy algae, plankton, right now are at 10% of what they were pre-muscle invasion. And because it's a similar story on Lake Huron, and I think to a, well, I'll talk about a little bit about Lake Erie if I can get a chance by the time I hit my, my deadline here. But, uh, <laughs> um, the, the plankton levels are about 10%, and what, what that's done is really rocked the fishery. I talked earlier about the salmon. The salmon were brought in to, to solve the first wave, help solve the first wave of environmental pollution, and that was largely tied to the demise of lake trout, which were the native predator in the Great Lakes, and that was tied to the arrival, well, some overfishing was involved in this, but primarily uh, sea lampreys that swam up uh, the shipping channels, the pre-seaway shipping channels, but they were man-made channels nonetheless. They came in and they knocked out the lake trout. With nothing to govern the smaller fish in the system, no wolf in the woods, so to speak, the little fish exploded. And unfortunately for the Great Lakes, behind the lamprey came another little invasive, spish, invasive species, fish, the alewife. And, and, and for a time on Lake Michigan in the 1960s, 90% of the fish biomass in Lake Michigan was alewife, which meant nine out of every 10 pounds was an Atlantic herring that is not naturally you know, evolved to, to live in the Great Lakes. And while they could survive, they were very vulnerable because they were constantly under stress living in fresh water and they would die by the billions, wash ashore. And in the late 60s, the beaches, I'm sure it was a similar situation here or nearby, they were almost uh, unusable just because of the mounds of rotting flesh. So they brought in salmon to, to take care of the alewives and it was a remarkably creative, um, and effective solution. We, we basically made lemonade out of these alewives, and, and instead of having you know rotting mounds of flesh, we turned the Great Lakes into a world-class salmon fishery, albeit one that is heavily, heavily maintained and manipulated by humans with hatchery stocking. But that solution, that salmon regime on Lake Huron and Michigan is getting wobbly. In fact, it's basically gone on Lake Huron. And that's because we solved this first problem by, by restitching together the top of the food chain. Here come the mussels behind and they hit the food chain or the food web, whatever you want to call it, in the most vulnerable place there is, and that's at the bottom. Alewife aren't getting enough to eat, salmon aren't getting enough alewife, and they've both gone poof. Uh, it's, it's been very difficult for the, for the commercial or the charter boat operators on Lake Huron 
um, they consider it a complete disaster. I don't. Talking about the state of the Great Lakes, look to Lake Huron if you want some optimism. Another invader came in behind the, the quagga and the zebra mussels, and that's the round goby. And it came from the same place, the Caspian Sea Basin, and it came the same way, up the St. Lawrence Seaway in the ballast tanks of an overseas freighter. Gobies have, since they were first discovered, I believe it was in the early 1990s. I don't have the date. I have the dates probably next to me on the floor there. But um, they, they, were, they were largely considered a nuisance, but... but now we're starting to look at them differently, just like we used to look at alewives as like a cockroach of a fish. Suddenly, when they became, you know, the base of this salmon industry, we started, uh, we literally in Wisconsin, were managing them as a protected species. The same kind of thing is starting to happen with gobies because gobies are nature built to eat these mussels. So what would otherwise be a nutritional dead end, what would otherwise be all this protein locked up in all these little shells, but and there's quadrillions of these mussels out there, is now being tapped by the gobies. And anything that can eat a goby is doing all right. Salmon can't. They're nature built to follow the schooling alewives. They will not go to the bottom where the mussels are, where the gobies are, and grub out a living. The native species are. Lake trout are coming back like they never have since World War II on Lake Huron. They're starting to reproduce on their own on in Lake Michigan as well. The walleye fishery on Lake Huron has exploded. Whitefish, which aren't piscivores, which is a fish-eating fish. If it's a death or a goby, whitefish are taking the goby. <laughs> it's, all, it's evolution on the fly, I would argue. Um, and, and the white fishery, the whitefish fishery is doing well. So that's really an encouraging sign. The problem is we haven't solved the ballast water problem. And, and while the shipping industry should be credited, hugely credited, for taking big steps to start flushing their ballast tanks with mid-ocean salt water to expel, to expel any freshwater hitchhikers, that's, that's gone a long way, but we, we just picked up another, it was announced last November here in Lake Erie, another form of zooplankton. The door isn't shut, and, 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 and the regulators will acknowledge it. And we need to shut that door, because all it takes is one new species that nobody's ever heard of. Nobody ever heard of the quagga mussel or the zebra mussel until it started rewiring the way the world's largest freshwater ecosystem works. And, and there's other things lurking out there. As a matter of fact, there are dozens of species on a federal watch list that are still capable of squeezing through this open door even with these existing ballast flushing regulations. And I would make an argument that it's really important that we solve this problem because we can. And we did solve our previous problems. And I, I'm just going to, I saved one page from this speech. And, and good, it's the right one. <laughs> I didn't want to have to start <laughs> digging through. Um, you know, uh, the, the Cuyahoga go burning was, you know, everybody considers it a, dis a disaster, and, and in a way it wasn't because it woke us up. And I, I just want to, to read what the reaction was outside this region. When I was writing this book, I, I kind of would spend days going into the archives of, of online um, PDFs of old newspapers, and I found this one from the Janesville Gazette. And, and, and this, is, this is when people said, enough is enough. And here's a quote from an editorial. The Cuyahoga River was beautiful once. It had clear, sparkling water once, and children could play on its banks. It had fish once, and greenery to shelter wildlife. Now it is a stinking, fetid cesspool, an open sewer running through the heart of one of the greatest cities of one of the great cities of the United States of America. And Cleveland is by no means alone. The same thing has happened all over this land. The pollution of our rivers and lakes is more than just shocking. It is more than a disgrace. It is a damned outrage and a crime against the people of the United States. The rivers do not belong to the industrialists. They belong to the people, all of the people. When a river or lake has, is polluted, it has been stolen from the people just as surely as if it were done at gunpoint. It has been stolen from you and your children and your children's children. And that, that just blows me away. <laughs> um, that kind of outrage, it was a spark that you know, dropped from a, chain, from a train that got the ball rolling and got us kicked into gear to fix these old, these old pollution problems. We have these new pollution problems, and we can talk about Lake Erie in the question and answer session, particularly the algae outbreaks. But what we need some, some 
now is something to you know make people say enough is enough. I thought that that uh, situation in Toledo in 2014 might be might be that event, but it wasn't. So anyway, um, that's about all I have to say about this, except for sometimes I'm given less than 25 or 28 minutes to give a talk. Sometimes I'm told to just go up there and give in two minutes and to tell people what my book's about. And it's, it's hard to say because I don't have a short answer. But as I was writing this speech, I started to think, maybe I should say... Think of it as a spark. Thank you. Hi, Scott. I'm going to just do the transition real quick. Stand wherever you want. Hello again. I'm Dan Malthrop, Chief Executive here at the City Club. Uh, today we're enjoying the annual State of the Great Lakes Address, this year given by Dan Egan, a reporter for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, but more importantly, he's the author of The Death and Life of the Great Lakes. We're about to begin the Q&A with all of you. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, or those of you joining us via our radio broadcast, our webcast, or the live simulcast at the Parma Snow branch of the Cuyahoga County Public Library. If you'd like to tweet a question, you can tweet it at the City Club. Our staff will work it into the program. And uh, you're also invited to add a question to the stream on our Facebook Live if you want as well, and we will try and find it there. Um, and I believe WCPN also has it streaming on Facebook Live, so you can leave it there. One of these places, we'll find it, we'll track it down, we'll work it in. We do want to remind you that your question should be brief and to the point, which is easy on Twitter, but less so here in the room. Um, holding the microphones today are our content coordinator, Teddy Eisenberg, and our director of programming, Stephanie Jansky. May we have our first question, please. Mr. Egan, welcome to Cleveland. Uh, glad you came back for the second time. Um, I just finished reading your book, and I found it very readable and interesting. Um, I have several questions that probably lead you into talking about Lake Erie. The main focus in the book seems to be on the invasive species that are fish, waterborne, you know, starting with the lamprey and going through the mussels. Uh, there's no mention that I saw of plants, and I wonder if there have been invasive species that have come in due to the situation that are plants that you could talk about. And related to that, the um, algae outbreaks in Lake Erie are heavily related to plants, algae, and I wish you would talk a little more about that and whether you think the efforts to educate farmers, et cetera, about phosphorus use or, uh, is adequate to make a solution to the problem. Sure. Yeah. You know, I, I, I didn't spend much time on plants. I didn't spend a lot of time on a lot of things in the book. Um, it started getting out of hand pretty quickly. And, and I talked to my editor and he said, if you keep this up, only your mom's going to read it. <laughs> so, so, so yes, that is, and, and it could be a subject for, for another book, but, but speaking specifically about the Western end of Lake Erie and the role that algae is playing, Toledo, to me, is just, it is a flashpoint because what's going on there really is a confluence of the three big threats facing the lakes today. And that's because these, this microcystis outbreak, it's this toxic form of blue-green algae. It's a native species. But back in the 60s, when we were overdosing the lake with, you know, laundry detergent, and we were getting these massive algae blooms in the subsequent dead zones, the assemblage of algae that was being produced in these blooms was many different species. But these mussels, these little buggers, they, they don't have brains, but they are smart enough to spit this microcystis back out. You can go on YouTube and see uh, lab studies in these aquariums where they'll suck every fleck out of the water until they get to, and you can't tell, it's, we can't tell it's microcystis. They can, and they spit it back out. So they've basically selected for this algae. So when you get an algae outbreak on the lake now, particularly on the western end, it's more likely to be this toxic form. Further complicating this is that the bigger rains are becoming more common on the western end. Well, in, I, I was looking specifically at the uh, Maumee Basin for the research I did. But you get, you get a pulse of, of, of stormwater coming off the landscape before the, the corn crops have a chance to take up this, this phosphorus fertilizer. That phosphorus goes into the water. And, and so, yeah, I don't have my numbers in front of me again, but, but we're, 
you know, well within the limits of, of the phosphorus limits that were prescribed following the, um, Dr. Seuss's Lorax, uh, and, and yet the, the, the blooms have returned. And, and that's because the, the phosphorus washing in in these rainstorms is a highly dissolve, highly reactive form of phosphorus. It, it comes in and it dissolves and it's picked up by, uh, by the algae. So, we can solve this problem. You know, I think I think people in this room are well aware that they've written a prescription, a modern day prescription for Lake Erie, just as regulators wrote a prescription for Lake Erie back in the dark days of the Lorax. They're talking about a 40% reduction in phosphorus going to the into the lake. But we took our medicine back in the 1970s. We spent things like $4 billion on sewage treatment and, and, and Lord knows how much on, on industrial uh, regulation and, and technologies. So far, the state of Ohio hasn't even formally declared the open waters of Lake Erie as impaired, which would be the first step to invoking forced cutbacks through the Clean Water Act. Now, if you can't drink the water of a lake, even after it goes through water purification or water treatment, if you can't, you know, reliably, you know, feel good that your your kid's brushing his teeth and isn't going to get sick, if you can't go to the beach and, and reliably expect it to be open, how can you not call that impaired? Um, I, I don't know what the answer to that is, except for you call it impaired. So, yeah, we have a problem over there, and I think it's fixable. And I think that we should, you know, live up to what previous generations did, and we take our medicine, and it's going to cost some money. The thing about these regulations, though, is it, if we didn't force these restrictions back in the 70s, if Tide got to keep putting 12.8% phosphorus into its product by weight and 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 then cheer didn't <laughs> cheer decided to be a good guy you know uh cheer had a right to be mad uh, but if they have to then you know who who here except for me is isn't wearing a perfectly clean shirt today <laughs> you know we, we figured out how to make effective phosphorus uh or effective detergent without phosphorus and and the same thing can be done with how we apply fertilizer in particularly in the Maumee River Basin. And if that means the price of corn goes up, if that means it gets passed through, you know, and so maybe we pay a little bit more for our milk, but what's the price of a, a safe drink of water? I mean, it's, it is what it is. It's, you, you pay for it. So um, I, I think, and one other thing too, I mean, it, it, talking about Dr. Seuss, <sighs> I don't have these numbers in front of me, and I don't even have them on the floor, but uh, I, I believe about 40% today, 40% of the corn we're producing is, is going toward ethanol. And this isn't the elixir that it's been sold to be. Um, it comes with its own environmental costs, both in terms of the energy it takes to raise it, the land that's being consumed that might either be in, in you know, a, a restoration or a rest program, and the fertilizer that's going into the lake. So 40% of this corn is ending up in our gas tanks. So we're like, you know, poisoning our water to put fuel in our tanks a little bit cheaper. And that's something that, you know, you could rip right out of the Lorax or put right into the Lorax. So we've got a problem there. We know how to solve it and we need to do it. Hi, um, thanks for the presentation today. What did uh, the research that you did for your book show uh, about climate change compounding the problems you described and how soon and how much? Those big storms on, in the Western Basin are, are a prime example. Um, for my money, I think the big impact of climate change on the lakes in the immediate future will be or could be a dramatic change in, in the way water cycles through the system. Lake Erie's a little different because you know, it's so much smaller than all the other Great Lakes. But where I live, Milwaukee, it's on Lake Michigan. And Lake Michigan has historically, since records have been kept, I believe they started keeping them in the 1840s, has always been within three feet of a long-term average. That long-term average is 578 feet. And that's the surface of the lake above the ocean. It's never really at its average. It's either on its way down or it's on its way above, but it's this, you know, undulation. 
and, and, and that means that the lake's always within six feet of its high or its low, and always has been. That's not necessarily going to be the case going forward. We hit a record low three years ago on Lake Michigan, and then three years later, it didn't go to a record high, but it rose faster than any time in recent history. And this has been tied to ice cover on the lakes, and that's been tied to a subtly... I mean, you think the lakes would be are so big, they would be immune to little little disturbances uh, in, in, in weather patterns or climate patterns, but it turns out the opposite is true. If you don't get a healthy blanket of ice on the lakes during the winter, all that solar ra radiation that would normally be bounced back up into the heavens starts getting sucked into the lakes. And that starts the warming cycle as early as March. So when you hit September and October, the, lake, the lakes are warmer than they've ever been. There was a reading taken on a Lake Michigan buoy out in the middle of the lake, I think in 2013, that had it at, that, I mean, it was an anomaly, but still, it was 82 degrees. And, and normally, the, the lake would be about 59 degrees at that point. That, that's just, you know, that's one, one data point. But, but the lakes are warming, and, and this is significant because when they're warm in the fall, when, when the gales in November come blowing in, um, the, the differential, the cold, the cold air and the warm water uh, react in a way that basically the, the wind just starts pulling water out of the lakes. They start evaporating, so the water is getting sucked up into the sky. At the same time, we're getting these big storms. So the people that I'm talking to are saying, you know, we're, we're used to this three-foot swing, and not just used to it, we're addicted to it because that's how our marinas work, that's how our waste treatment works, that's how our drinking water supply works, that's how navigation works. Um, if these swings start getting bigger, people are going to be hurting in all sorts of ways. Erosion, they're talking about a swing of four or five feet instead of three feet. And this is on Michigan and Huron, which are actually the same lake. They call, I don't know why they, Lake Michigan is its own lake. I think probably because the United States just wanted its own Great Lake. But, um, you know, this is a massive expanse of water. And they're talking about, um, you know, swings being four or five feet, which means 10, as, my, as much as 10 feet from its high to its low. And, and I don't know what the solution is for that. I mean, we're going to have to adapt, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be problematic. So that's the big climate change message that I took from the research I was doing. What is your prognosis as far as the possibility of success with the recent efforts to uh, protect the Great Lakes from the invasion of Asian carp coming from the Mississippi River and the redirection by man of the Chicago River? It's, it's, a, it's a big unknown, but what is known is, is we could be doing more and a lot more. The Asian carp is a fascinating story. Uh, you know, I'll just tell you real quickly, people in this room, people in Chicago probably know this, just like people in Cleveland know all about the Cuyahoga. Chicago knows all about the carp. But, but these fish were brought over um, in the late 1960s by a, uh, by a fish farmer in, in Arkansas. And the conventional wisdom has been that these floods in the 1990s on the Mississippi somehow unleashed, unleashed them. But that's not where they originally how they originally got loose in the environment. This fish farmer sends, sends off, kind of like a mail order, for there's four species of Asian carp, and he wanted one called grass carp, which are remarkably good at eating rooted vegetation on the bottom of a lake, and he wanted them to keep his catfish farm clean. He got grass carp, which he wanted, then he got silver carp, big head carp, and black, head, black carp, and he didn't know what to do with those, so he turned them over to the Arkansas uh, Game and Fish Commission, which was a responsible thing to do. And if the Game and Fish Commission had been responsible, they probably would have, you know, dumped some bleach in that tank and called it a day. But they decided to, to, to play with them, to see if they could get them to breed, and it was remarkably diff difficult. I actually, I went down to Arkansas, into the archives, I think it was Central Arkansas University, I can't remember where it was, but this, this fish farmer left his archives because he was, he was a kind of a big character down in Arkansas. He was a governor candidate. Anyway, uh, they brought in an aquaculturist from the UN who was posted in DC to, to get these fish to reproduce. And so they got a crop of silver. Or they killed all the black carp before they could get them to reproduce, but they got the silver and the big head to reproduce. And they found out that they were, like the mussels, remarkably devastatingly efficient at, at sucking plankton out of the water column. So 
they went, this is now we're in the mid late 70s. Um, Jimmy Carter is president. They go to the EPA, uh, they being the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, <clears throat> and they say, we have, we have these amazingly uh, filter, amazing filter feeding fish that we think we could use in sewage treatment lagoons to clean up the mess in the lagoons. And so they got a grant from the EPA, and so they had this, this plan that they would, they would um, clean up the lagoons with these fish, and then they would harvest the fish and sell them and the, for, for food, and then that would fund further sewage treatment. And it's an elegant idea, but it's a little repulsive, and the FDA <laughs> stepped in and said, you're not going to do that. And, and when the Carter administration uh, went out, so did the funding for this program. And because these guys had such difficulty getting these fish to, to breed, they, uh, they just let them loose. I mean, I personally talked to a guy who let them loose, and they thought there's no way that these things are going to be able to reproduce in the wild. And, you know, nature finds a way, and it did. And so those things have been migrating up the Mississippi River Basin ever since. And I was talking earlier about the need to address ballast water problems from ships sailing up the seaway. A good way, simple way to look at this is that's the front door to the lakes. The back door is the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal, which is an artificial connection between the Great Lakes Basin and the Mississippi River Basin. The Great Lakes span, you know, this, an area the size of the United Kingdom. But before, before settlement, they were as isolated in many ways as like a pond in Wisconsin's North Woods because they had no direct aquatic connection to any other system. We ruined that with, with the seaway and the other canals on the East Coast, and then we ruined it on the Western end with the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal. So these fish would otherwise be swimming up the Mississippi River Basin, and they would, you know, meet their end there at some point. But this canal provides a pathway into the lakes, and the only thing standing between it and the fish at the moment is a, uh, an electric fish barrier that has a history of, of leaks. I mean, uh, speaking of leaks, I got a, a video from somebody with the Fish and Wildlife Service of fish actually swimming, little fish flitting through the barrier. Apparently, little fish need, need a bigger jolt than, than big fish. That's the way electricity works. They don't have as much surface area, I guess. I'm not... <laughs> it's not my field. Um, but but the, the, the point is, is that this, this is a barrier. It also has a history of, of power outages. This is, this is not a long-term solution. And, and there, there is a radical solution floating around out there, and that is to plug the canal. And that would force dramatic changes in the way Chicago treats its wastewater right now. Because, I mean, this is hard to believe, but only recently... Uh, did they? At, I think they have three primary uh, wastewater treatment facilities, and at one of them, only at one of them, have they started disinfecting the sewage, the the effluent coming through them. The rest, it's basically primary treatment, which is just sorting out the solids, and then they put it in the canal and let the ba the bad stuff bake its way out on its way down to St. Louis. Where, well, speaking of watered down beer, no, but that's St. Louis. <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> I like I like Budweiser. But, uh, but, but, but Chicago, I mean, that, that canal is basically legally a, a three-sided pipe. It doesn't have to receive waters that, that, up, that would be to Clean Water Act standards. Um, if you plug the canal, Chicago can't do that anymore. They're going to have to start treating their sewage, you know, they're going to have to spend the $4 billion plus, plus, plus to, um, to treat their sewage to the standards that Chicago or that Cleveland does and that Milwaukee does and that Detroit does, that we all do. Um, you plug that canal, you plug the pathway for the carp. And somebody could say, okay, well, what about somebody who just lifts one around the barrier or, you know, they somehow get into the bilge water of a barge and, you know, they're always going to find a way. But there is nothing like this canal as far as uh, an invasive species pathway. It's 160 feet wide in places. It's some 25 feet deep and it's a straight shot into Lake Michigan. And this isn't a pathway just for carp. I think there's 39 species that they've identified could make their way out of the lakes into the Mississippi River Basin. That's how zebra and quagga mussels made, made their way out. And, and now they, they're all over the West where they're threatening to gum up the hydroelectric dam system in the Pacific Northwest. They're already in Lake Mead and Lake Powell and the Colorado River system. And you know it, it's a constant struggle to keep those hydroelectric dams whirring because they plug pipes and those pipes are the cooling systems for the dam. So a little tiny fingernail sized mollusk can stop something as big as Hoover Dam. And, and 
this this just uh, for, indulge me here. They're, they're, they are finding people right and left. There are checkpoints out on the road all over the West. I, I was out in Lake Powell and um, I was talking to a ranger who was in charge of their inspection program before the lake fell to a, a quagga mussel infestation. And they were like finding people who didn't go through checkpoints. They weren't finding them. They, they were taking, they were throwing them in jail, you know, until they got just not for months, but um, they'd go to court and, you know, they were getting fined as much as $5,000 for not going through a checkpoint. These are local guys with jet skis. Everybody knew we're only jet skiing on Lake Powell. They weren't a, a, a transporter, a vector for this invasion, but, but that was the law. <clears throat> That's one lake, and that has dozens of boat ramps, and there's, you know, hundreds of lakes and thousands of boat ramps, and you just can't get a handle on it. But you can get a handle on them getting, on the, getting a foothold on the continent. I mean, you've got, I'd say, tens of thousands of pathways for these, for these species to invade new waters out west, and they all come through a single exquisite pinch point, and that's the St. Lambert Lock down by Montreal on the St. Lawrence Seaway. It's 80 feet wide, and if you stop trouble at those doors, you save a whole continent's worth of trouble. Anyway, back to the back to the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal. There's there's other species behind the carp that could be making their way up, like the snakehead, that fish that you know can slither across land. Um, it's the carp may or may not get in the lake. I think it's probably inevitable that they do, but I think in many ways the mussels have beat them to the punch. There isn't the plankton population out there that will allow them to thrive in the manner that they have in the Mississippi River Basin. Those are very brothy rivers. Lake Michigan's almost as clear as this drinking water today. The bays and harbors are a different story, and unfortunately that's where most people recreate, and I'm sure some of you have seen these these fish jump, you know, and they, so they ruin any, any kind of water skiing or jet boating or anything on the infect, infested waters. And, and that happens to be where all these pleasure boats are. And the Great Lakes states, I think, have 4 million registered recreational boats. So it's not just an ecological concern, it's a big economic concern. But, you know, it can take years for, for you know, you get invasion and then you get a reproducing population and native predators can keep it in check for a while and then something you know, some weird weather event happens and they pull off a big spawn and then, and then you have a problem. But that could be in a generation, it could be in two generations, it could be in five years, it could be in never. But, but that Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal is a problem one way or the other, and, and I think it, it does need to be fixed. If not, if not plugged, there are other tools that they could use, and, and they have a plan to use one of the locks on the canal as kind of a kill zone and that's been put together by, I believe, the Fish and Wildlife Service, but the new administration is is holding off on releasing it. So, yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my question involves the invasive species coming up through the St. Lawrence. Mm -hmm. um, I'm one of the directors of the Cuyahoga, uh, Cl uh, Cleveland Cuyahoga Port Authority, mm -hmm. and we have two purposes, the maritime um, um, quality here on our river, our lake, and the port, and then also real estate development finance for economic development for the sure. region. I say that because um, uh, my concern is the uh, question of ships coming up the St. Lawrence. I hope it is not your recommendation or thought that we should in any way limit or reduce the ships coming in the St. Lawrence, because as you've indicated, um, ships are coming up with recommendations and, and uh, regulations to um, uh, flush their ballast water. I mean, could you tell us your thoughts on that? Because I also mm -hmm. understand what you just said with respect to that there's a lot of ramps all along the St. Lawrence where s species are, are also I'm, ta yeah, I'm talking uh, ramps beyond the Great Lakes Basin. Okay. But yeah, I, I am not saying shut the seaway down, and I am not... I mean, the seaway is an incredibly important piece of infrastructure for the movement of cargo in North America. But what I am saying is that we need to look at the, the, the very small sector of ships that are causing the problem, the invasive species problem. The numbers in recent years, going from memory here, but it's less than 5% of the cargo carried on the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Great Lakes is carried on these salties. The overwhelming majority of cargo sailing on the lakes and the seaway is moving from one North America port to another North American port and poses no risk of bringing something in from around the globe. 
the industry has done a lot as far as you know this ballast water flushing and and the EPA is now turning the screws on them and forcing ballast water treatment systems but the industry is saying that this is a really hard the, the, the standard that they've been given is hard to meet furthermore the EPA has been sued under the Clean Water Act thanks to the Cuyahoga River catching fire <laughs> all these stuff it's all connected somebody should write a book about this but <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no, the, so so under the Clean Water Act, the EPA is is forcing even stricter standards on on the shipping industry. Meanwhile, there's a movement afoot to move the management of ballast water away from the Environmental Protection Agency, thereby pulling it under away from the purview of the Clean Water Act and giving it to the U.S. Coast Guard, which appropriately so has historically been more concerned about mariner safety than the ecological integrity of the lakes. What I'm saying is we need to fix this problem faster than not. It's been known, it's been a known problem since we've got the, the muscles in 1986 was when the first zebra mussel was discovered. That's 31 years and, and we're, still, we're still not there. And do you get another decade? Do you get another two decades? Do you get another two species? Do you get another five species? Maybe if the problem's so hard to solve, maybe you do look at at, at, at offloading that cargo before the St. Lambert lock and putting it on a, a regional fleet of boats and moving them up, up the seaway into the region. Shipping in the Great Lakes is big business, but it's been big business for more than 100 years. Duluth, I think that's the busiest port on the Great Lakes. That was busier the decade before the seaway opened than, than it is today. Um, there's plenty of there's plenty of business to be had with just the regional shipping, so I'm not saying shut these ships out, but I'm saying if we get to the point where it's so intractable that you know people are throwing up their arms, then do a cost benefit analysis, okay, and see what what has it cost us in terms of of the invaders that we already have, what could it cost us in terms of what might be coming next, and what's the economic benefit of this small portion of traffic that is using the system. And there is an answer out there right now. Uh, two logistics, uh, one's a professor, one's a state guy in Michigan looked at this in 2005 and again in 2007. And they found it was a first blush, but it withstood peer review um, that to move these cargoes from the salties by some other means, and that could be by rail, by truck, by barge, by a lake specific uh, fleet, they looked at all the options and and came to the conclusion that we were saving about fifty five million dollars annually with with the salty traffic. So you know if we've got a two billion dollar problem and and you can compensate the shipping industry too. So just one just to put this in a little perspective, the volume of cargo that we're getting on salties today is I think last year it was somewhere around ten million tons, and that sounds like a lot. But when you break it down, it's basically the equivalent of one and maybe two trains a day coming in from the East Coast. I would never want to see ships off the, go off the lakes. I, I love them, you know, but, but I do love the idea of a, a nature-balanced lake, and I do think that this small portion of the traffic is, continues to jeopardize it today, and I do acknowledge that that's controversial. But I think, you know, if... It deserves an honest look. And I know Betty Sutton spoke here a couple of years ago. She's the former administrator of the Seaway. Her predecessor, Collister Johnson, Collister Johnson Jr., I think, uh, I, I talked to him one time and I asked him what he thought about this study that these guys had done. And he said, I haven't looked at it. And I asked him why he hadn't looked at it. And he said, because it's just mumbly jumbly stuff. So, so let's not be afraid to look at it. And if the industry can make its case, that's the way it should work. Hey, Dan, can you talk a little bit about your optimism for Lake Huron? You mentioned that yeah. it's the place to be optimistic, and I love optimism. Yes, so. thank you. So do I. You know, people do ask me if this is um, a grim, depressing book, and, and I don't think it is. I mean, I think it's just it's fascinating. I'm, I don't have a science background. I have a history background. Well, I studied history in college, but I did a lot of things in college. <laughs> 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 which I, I wouldn't necessarily carry claim the title of. Um, 
but uh, yeah, you know, the, the walleye fishery on, on Lake Huron is exploding and, and the lake trout, which have only been sustained by stocking for, you know, a half a century, they're now talking about eliminating stocking lake trout. These are the native predators. I mean, they're, they're built to be out in the lake. A salmon, if it doesn't get enough to eat, they live hard and fast. They live for three years, they grow big, and they die. A lake trout can just shut itself down in, in, in lean years. They can live for 20 or 30 years. And, and that makes them kind of the perfect predator to control the ebb and flow of booms and busts in the Great Lakes in terms of you know just the, the forage availability. So what we're looking at maybe is a future where we don't have, at least to the extent we have in the last two or three decades, the, the salmon bonanza fishery, but we have one that's more naturally balanced and one that's built for the long haul. And I think that that's really a worthy goal. We're never going to return to the lakes all the fish species that we lost, and we're never going to bring back the forests in our lifetimes. We're never going to have the lakes, the, the mythical lakes of pre-settlement days. But if we can move toward a system that is more naturally balanced, I think everybody wins, and that should be the goal. So, yeah. Dan, thank you so much. That was um, a spark and a catalyst, and, and we appreciate the ending on a note of optimism. Today at the City Club, we have been enjoying our annual State of the Great Lakes Address given by Dan Egan, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel reporter and author of The Death and Life of the Great Lakes. Mr. Egan appears as part of our Sustainability NEO series sponsored by the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District. Additional support for today's program is provided by the Great Lakes Brewing Company. We thank you both for your support. Today's forum is also the Stanley and Hope Edelstein Forum on the Environment. They were beloved members of the City Club, and we're grateful to have their family and friends with us today. We appreciate your generosity and your continued support of the City Club. Mr. Egan also appears as part of the City Club's Authors in Conversation series, supported in part by the residents of Cuyahoga County through a public grant from Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. We appreciate your support. And the, our community partner for today's program is the Cleveland Water Alliance. Our hospitality partner is the Metropolitan at the Nine Hotel. Those are valued partners as well. Additionally, we welcome guests at tables hosted by the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, Cuyahoga River Restoration, Huntington Bank, and the Lake County Metro Parks. We also welcome students from Flow Homeschool Co-op. Student participation in City Club forums is provided by many foundations, including the William E. Weiss Foundation. Thank you all for being here today. The sale of Mr. Egan's book, The Death and Life of the Great Lakes, is provided by a cultural exchange. And that brings us to the end of our program today. Thank you very much, Mr. Egan. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Our forum is adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund.